uh, Executive Office Committee meeting. Uh, we are present today. We don't have anybody on by Starleaf at the minute, so I won't need to do um, any introductions as to who's in the room. And in fairness, we don't, probably don't need to do that anymore. The purpose of Starleaf is that people can see who is in the room. So um, at this stage, in terms of apologies, I haven't received any. Um, apologies, so we will be expecting uh, Trevor and George to join us at some point during the meeting. And just as ever, the, the meeting is being recorded and broadcast through our Parliament buildings and online. And just to keep a little eye on any uh, mobile devices should they interact with the sound equipment. Um, the draft minutes, uh, item two, the draft minutes from the meeting on the 5th of July, or sorry, on page five from the 1st of July. Are members content that that's a true and accurate record of the meeting? Yep. Yeah. Agreed. Okay, so if that's agreed, we'll have those signed and pass them back. And then uh, matters arising, uh, members, on page three of the table pack, um, there's correspondence from the Executive Office regarding the remaining stages of the Executive Committee Functions Bill, which was granted accelerated passage in the Assembly on Monday. Um, the Department is proposing that the consideration stage of the Bill is scheduled for Tuesday the 21st, and that further consideration stage and final stage are selected and scheduled for Tuesday the 28th of July. Um, so, with those health regulations coming, that leaves me and Pat a few busy days where we have all the items for the nearly the full day uh, on the next uh, few Tuesdays. So that's just an information uh, update for members. Um, if we move on then to item four, which is the victim's payment scheme, we will have the oral evidence session with the department officials. Uh, the information is available on page 12 um, and that includes uh, the clerk's brief on the victim's payment scheme and the Hansard from the Commission for Victims and Survivors Overview Briefing and the Hansard from the Victim and Survivors Overview Briefing. So those um, papers are available for you uh, in the pack. And we'll have, I think we're turning to us again, I think you've already been with us to discuss this, or if not this, certainly another issue, but you're certainly returning uh, officials to ourselves, so uh, we can welcome uh, Mark and Gareth back again. We'll give you a wee moment to get settled in there and then we will pass over to yourselves for uh, an update and then afterwards we can move to some question and answer. Um, at this stage we don't have anybody via the Starleaf which is at either side although we do have two members that are likely to join uh, so whenever we're doing the question and answer you can expect that some of it comes via the speaker and the television at the side. So I'll pass over to yourselves then to give us uh, an update please. Okay, Chair, thanks very much. We, ha we have indeed been up here before on victims' payments on, on a, a couple of occasions when the main topic was actually, I think it was the public expenditure or, 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 or it was a monitoring around or whatever, but we certainly have touched on it before. Um, I was just, Chair, going to make some, some opening remarks and then really pass over to questions to give members a chance just to explore the various issues. Um, so, first of all, significant work has been undertaken by officials to date on the delivery structures for the, the victims' payment scheme. However, there are important issues that remain to be resolved, and they include the designation of an executive department to exercise the administrative functions of the board on the board's behalf, the source of funding for the scheme, and uh, clarity on how exceptions are to be interpreted. A series of discussions have taken place with officials and relevant NICS departments in relation to the administration of the scheme. Uh, this work is ongoing and further, further discussion uh, on this is, is, is happening. Security of funding of the scheme has not yet been confirmed. Um, however, the executive agreed to release uh, an additional £2.5 million to advance necessary preparatory work for the scheme. There's a shared view uh, that Westminster has an obligation uh, and must deliver on its responsibility to support funding for this scheme, and efforts are continuing to resolve this issue as swiftly as possible. Uh, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister have made it clear that they are committed to addressing all of the outstanding issues. The Westminster regulations came into force on the 29th of May. Further time, however, is still required to deal with outstanding issues and to establish the necessary arrangements for the operation of the scheme. 
Uh, ministers have made clear that they know that this is deeply disappointing for many victims and survivors who need this support. Ministers have indicated that they share that disappointment uh, and will work to do all that they can to get this scheme uh, delivered as soon as possible. Okay. There we go. Indeed. <coughs> Quick advice. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and I thank you for your attendance here today because, I mean, at the absolute core of this scheme are people. Um, and I suppose victims um, within the sector feel like they are being used as a political football. Um, and that's unfortunate because it's compounding the hurt and the pain that they uh, are suffering, uh, the hurt and pain that some of them have suffered for most of their lives. Um, and this pension, uh, whilst you know, is unlikely to be transformational to a person's life, it's certainly a recognition and it is a, an opportunity for them to feel like they have recognition for the pain that they have suffered and to help in some way to deal with the opportunities that they've missed in their lives. So this whole scheme is absolutely uh, critical that it is delivered and that it's delivered in a speedy manner. And I suppose from an observational perspective, the difficulty is, is that there's the political football here uh, between the parties in, in terms of, of definitions and then also between London and here in terms of who um, actually picks up the bill. So it certainly uh, is hoped that this, for that victim sector, that that can be completed, the scheme can be completed and introduced as soon as possible and hopefully there can be some uh, heart taken from the fact that money, substantial enough monies, were set aside for the administration of the scheme. But to move to a couple of questions, can I ask just maybe uh, in terms of officials, what level of conversation has taken place um, maybe between yourselves and London in terms of the payment for the scheme? I mean, is this something that's just left the ministerial level or is it something that there's been officials have been having conversations? Is there papers being circulated in the background? Is there work that's been undertaken? Or is it just something that's been parked because there can't be a resolution in terms of the finance? Well, Chair, the, the, the whole issue of funding has been raised uh, both at, at official level and at ministerial level. Um, it was raised by us to the, the Department of Finance, obviously, because we are in, we are in close contact with them um, about the potential cost of the scheme and, and, and the need for it to be funded. And the Permanent Secretary there has written to uh, the NIO Permanent Secretary on a couple of occasions. Also, the, um, the uh, Minister of Finance has written to the Secretary of State uh, about the whole issue of funding, and there, ha there has been that passage of correspondence. Um, so really, the, the, the negotiation now has to be at ministerial level. It has reached that high political level. Uh, our role as officials would be in advising ministers on what the potential costs actually are uh, and what, what the factors are that feed into those costs. It's really for ministers now to take that and continue that discussion <coughs> with the NIO and with the Treasury. And do you feel, uh, is the conversation happening at ministerial level or it, would it be your understanding that that's waiting to happen or at what stage of the process? I mean, we've gone through many times, I, I suppose, within the executive in London in terms of discussions about finance. At what stage do you put it against others in terms of a yardstick as to where we are? Well, th this is one of the key issues on the executive's agenda and it's a key issue for the First and Deputy First Minister. Um, there have been exchanges of letters with the, Sec the Secretary of State, and there have been a number of discussions with the Secretary of State. So, uh, in response to your question, Chair, I would say this is very much a live issue and one which is being actively pursued uh, by the First and De De Deputy First with the, with the Secretary of State. Going back to the, um, the 2.5 million that was allocated, um, I think there's still a bit of ambiguity about just maybe what, I mean, is that 2.5 million for the next number of years? Is that 2.5 million for the next year? Is that something that will establish the system and then people can interact with it and that, that figure will trail off in terms of being required as a, an administrative fee? Because it's just kind of 2.5 million for administering. It just, it's, it's a lot of money, but just trying to get a feel for what that will do. Well, the 2.5 million was allocated as part of the June monitoring exercise, and it was uh, to allow uh, officials to continue to work to make the administrative preparations that are necessary in order for the scheme to be able to operate. So this, it's for things like uh, developing the, the IT system. Uh, it's for things like developing or, or identifying staff who can take uh, some of this work uh, forward. 
uh, it, would, it would be for things like finding accommodation for where uh, the team that will actually deliver this, uh, uh, the actual scheme in, 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 uh, in practice, where they will be located. So it's for those administrative preparations, but it's only for this year because that is in-year money uh, for, for the current year. And obviously, the amount of that that will be spent will be dependent on the extent of progress that can be made and when final decisions are made, because uh, the, the pace of development will, no, will, without any doubt, increase when there's clarity over a designated department and we can then move into full preparatory mode. It, it seems, uh, again, let me just press just a wee bit on this, it seems like a lot of money for just identifying things, you know, to, to identify accommodation, to identify staff, to... Um, you know, to, to look at an IT system. I mean, is it is it in that you identify, for example, an accommoda- accommodation, and then if the scheme progresses and you need the accommodation, there's enough there to actually deliver the accommodation as well. Because you know, two and a half million. It, it, it's because I think maybe some of the within the sector are feeling two and a half million seems like a lot of money. There's going to be a lot of movement, and as I say, just if it's merely just identifying a few things or. You know, highlighting staff or putting a, an IT system, that seems like a small output for two and a half million input is... Well, it, it would be for a mixture of things, uh, Chair. Some, some of them would be uh, 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 preparatory in terms of, of, of um, drawing up approaches and so forth, but it would also be for firm spend on staff, for example. I mean, there are staff in the, in the executive office who are, who are taking forward work around this. There will be staff required uh, on staff costs to be met uh, in, in the uh, department that we're working with uh, on this, uh, there will be real costs around the uh, exploration of and, and the um, work with the um, uh, an outside agency around uh, the the information technology that's going to be required here. So there, there will be real costs around that. Um, uh, we would want to look at whether we can actually secure accommodation, but again, we have to be mindful that we need to make sure that the. The progress is coming behind, and, the, and that the, the, the decisions will, will be made. So, uh, the, the, there are practical things that that money will be spent on. But as I, I said at the start, the actual quantum for this year will be dependent on how quickly actual decisions are made. Because there are some things you wouldn't do until you were clear about the precise time frame. In, in terms of yourselves um, as officials, have have you as officials been tasked within the department to? explore the criteria for eligibility for the scheme i mean it seems that that is the crunch that is the that is the bit that is holding the rest of the jigsaw puzzle from falling into place um you know is that something that officials are working on are you preparing papers are you working with other government departments maybe the nio and, and others to try and examine that to, to, to examine the implications or is it something that's just parked at ministerial level and you're waiting uh, on guidance from there well i think there's two aspects to this there's there's the aspects of the processes and procedures that would be required to assist with the determination of eligibility uh, under the main scheme uh, and I'll let Gareth pick up the detail of that in, in a moment in terms of evidence retrieval and that sort of thing. But then there's the other issue about the exceptions, which I think is what your, uh, the thrust of your question is. And really, that is one for the NIO, uh, because the NIO, the Secretary of State, is to bring forward guidance around those exceptions to make clear uh, what the circumstances would, would, would be in terms of determining whether, whether someone with uh, a, 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 an unspent conviction or uh, in other exceptional circumstances should not be entitled to the, uh, the payment. There was to be advice made available on that, and that has not yet been publicly made uh, available. So we, we await that advice from NIO. Gareth, do you would say something about the other aspects of the eligibility? Uh, yes, in, in terms of the, uh, the other aspects of eligibility, which are, um, were you injured in a, a troubles-related incident or in its immediate aftermath? Um, are you permanently disabled? Uh, are you is the disablement uh, above a certain level, above the the fourteen percent level? Um, those are all aspects that we'll be taking forward the the preparatory work on, uh, and that are included in the the two and a half million. Uh, so, for example, uh, we're working with the. Uh, public records office uh, with PSNI and with the health service about how we can assist people who are applying in uh, getting at records and, and getting at information that will support their application. Um, we're, uh, we're also going to be developing the uh, you know, assessment model, um, which is based on, on, on a model that's used in other places, including for uh, industrial injuries. Um, but there is some further work that needs done on that, particularly 
generally around uh, psychological, psychiatric injuries. Um, so that there are practical things that will be happening there uh, within the, the allocation that's been given. But as Mark says, the, uh, the bigger questions, there are very clearly political issues there. Maybe just finally then, is it is this feel unique in terms of a sort of process, you know, a, a, a bill that sort of starts in Westminster, but nearly the, 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 the payment for it is required from here, or, you know, there's some eligibility criteria coming from, from Westminster being matched with, with, with decisions that are taken here, or is that, does that feel relatively normal? It feels oh. like it's falling between a couple of stools and then it's trying to bring those together. But again, underscoring all this, is the victims that are being left out there with nothing while this, this, this tries to find out where it settles. Is that something that's regular or has happened in the past? Well, uh, so that's quite a complex question. Um, there, there would be provisions made in... Uh, in, in Britain, where there'd be a legislative consent motion for, the, for them to be carried across to have effect uh, in Northern Ireland. And, and where that happens, uh, we would normally expect, I think, that we would have a, an appropriate Barnet consequential or something that would cover those costs. But this is a different situation because this is, is something that applies only in Northern Ireland, but yet was legislated for uh, under the EFEF Act um, for Northern Ireland. And that's at the heart of the the, the debate about the funding uh, and the, uh, the the permanent secretary in the Department of Finance has made the point that under the statement of funding policy, whichever uh, body actually uh, brings forward the, the proposal uh, and, and uh, legislates for it, has to uh, bear the cost of that. And that's the, the, the argument that's being made. Now, there's an argument being made back that there were exceptional circumstances, and therefore the, the statement of funding doesn't apply. But that, that is why we are getting into a, a, a political uh, argument here. Uh, it's not one that will be readily sorted, I don't think, by, resort, by resorting to guidance. Thank you. Doug? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, Mark, Gareth, thank, thank you. Um, I mean, it's an extremely difficult situation that we find ourselves in here, and without a doubt, uh, this is a UK-wide scheme, um, uh, and I think the Westminster Government uh, need to be stumping up the land share of the monies towards this. I think that just makes common sense because people in Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, as far afield as Australia, Canada uh, and in parts of Europe will all be getting monies from this scheme. And it's unfair just to lump all of that onto um, the, to, to the executive office. Uh, I think that's a, that's a practical way of, of, of looking at it, I guess. But can I just delve into this 2.5 million a little bit, if I can, please, uh, Mark? And, and I get what you're saying is for IT and accommodation and for people uh, and preparatory work. I get all that. But then we're going to hand this over to a lead department. So are, are we saying that that 2.5 million is doing all of this preparatory work to hand over to a lead department? Yet one of those lead departments who have a very particular way on how they want to run it let's say the Department for Justice, who have a very particular way that they feel it should be run if they're the lead department. Are we spending money that, that, that could be just be wasted in many ways? Is this, is this, I'm trying to get to the point, is this progressing things forward or is it just keeping us standing still at the minute? No, it's, it's, it's very much progressing things forward. Um, I mean, the situation at the minute is that until a, a department is formally designated, there are a number of things that can't happen to uh, and, and that we can't progress. Um, but nevertheless, um, the Justice Minister has made it clear that um, if her department is designated, uh, that provided there are assurances around funding uh, and provided there's a clear date uh, set for implementation, that she would be prepared to take this on. And she, she has already made, made that clear. Um, and uh, in, in, in the interim, um, there, there's also been helpful agreement that officials can progress on the administrative preparations that I, that, that I talked about. Uh, they, they can only go so far until, as I mentioned, a designated department is actually appointed because other things kick in at that point. But there are things that, that, that uh, we in the executive office can do working with uh, uh, colleagues in the Department of Justice, uh, mainly in the compensation services, who, who provide similar type uh, 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 services here, we can start working up and working with them on processes, on procedures, looking at the IT system, what would be required, what a payment system would look like. We can also look at, uh, we'll have to meet some of the cost of that department in doing this preparatory work. So some of that money would go to that department, but it would be for that kind of part, uh, that kind of preparatory work, and it would come from us to, 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 to them. And this work will be managed under a project board, which I chair at the minute. 
Department of Justice are, are a part of that. We've had this in place for, for so, uh, a lot of months uh, at, at, at the, the, the moment to try and manage all of this work. So certainly it will not be wasted money. Uh, the, only, the, only, the only question there might be is whether, depending on the time frame, all of the money would be required, but we won't know. It will depend very much on the time frame of a decision around a designated department. Yeah, and, 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 and Mark, I get that, and, and sorry to labour the point, um, but let's be clear. We, we talk about the Department for Justice as if they're wanting this open-handed, and they're, they're not. They think it should go to the Department for Communities. They think it sits better with the Department of Communities. So there's a bit of kickback there. Let's not just say that they're willing partners here. Uh, and, and when you're saying talking about accommodation, uh, the Department for Justice wanted to go to the compensation services, so they want that joined accommodation. And if you're working towards it going to the Department for Justice, and all of a sudden it doesn't go to the Department for Justice, it goes to the Department for Communities or somewhere else, then that is money that's being wasted. You, 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 you literally do a proprietary work uh, and already taken on board it's going to be going to the Department for Justice as the lead department. So can I ask you then, just to be absolutely clear, if the issues that are resolved are resolved, Will it definitely be the lead department? Will be the Department for Justice? If all the issues are resolved, I, I, I can't. I can't give you an answer to that because that is it's, it's clearly a, a matter that ministers have to decide on. All I can say is what I've said that the minister, uh, that, that the Minister of Justice has said that if her department is designated, uh, she will take it forward. She did express some reservations. All departments have expressed reservations because the scheme is going to present challenges. There's no question about that. No matter who does it, the scheme will present challenges. Um, but she has indicated that she would be content for her department to take it forward because she doesn't want victims and survivors to be delayed in, in receiving uh, their, their pay, pay payments. Um, but, but she wants those assurances around the funding and around the time scale. I, and, quite, and, and she's absolutely right to, to, to want those assurances. But you can see the point I'm making is we are actually making priority work that is going to be the Department of Justice, and it might not be. But, but let me ask a, a very pointed question. I get all of the issues that we have in regards to eligibility and where the money is coming from, but what is stopping us pointing to a, a, a appointing a lead department? What is stopping us just saying, well, this will be the lead department? Uh, we've got these issues we're going to deal with. Nothing will start until they're dealt with. But what stops us, or who's stopping us, from appointing a lead department? Well. That's a, a, a question, really, that, that, that has to be answered by ministers, and they have answered that by saying that there are, are before a, a designated department can be uh, identified and this work taken forward, they want the, um, the, the assurance around the funding and they want the assurance around the uh, el el eligibility here. So uh, that goes straight back to the political point I, I, I made at the outset uh, uh, in terms of... Um, <coughs> wanting that confidence about the source of funding. Uh, it, it, I mean, the, the costs here are going to be significant, oh, very, yeah. very significant. And uh, to move ahead in advance of being clear about the costs is <coughs> tricky for any minister. Um, so it's, 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 really, it's, a, it's a political point. Sorry to interrupt. I've just received a message from Trevor Clark. Um, could you message him the dial-in option? Yes, brilliant. Thank okay. you very much. I'm sorry for interrupting. Mark, Mark I, I, I get that. And you're absolutely right. It's a political decision, but it goes back to the point that I've just made. And the point that you're saying is that you're spending some of this £2.5 million uh, on preparatory work, and some of that preparatory work is looking at um, joined up personnel working alongside the compensation services, which Parliament for Justice, but we haven't done the Parliament for Justice yet. So, so it's, it's a bit of a chicken and an egg here. So if we're already saying and, and I guess we are, I think everybody knows this, that what we're really saying is the lead department is going to be the Department for Justice, but we're just not saying it. And we're actually spending money now to make that happen. You know, um, then I, I guess there's nothing stopping us from saying, and the lead department is going to be the Department for Justice. That's the point I'm saying. It doesn't resolve any of the issues. But you know what it does? It tells people we're taking a step forward. And that's the, the point that I'm making is, you know, so I have a concern where that 2.5 million is being spent. I, I wouldn't mind a breakdown of that 2.5 million now, because if you're using it to, to sort out accommodation, which is um, joined up together with compensation services, Department for Justice, then the decision has been made. So you, you see where I'm coming from? Yeah, no, I understand the point that you're making. And if maybe I can address it in, uh, from a slightly different angle. I mean, part of your question is, will some of this expenditure be nugatory? If, if there was a different uh, department chosen, for example. But the, the work that we're doing, uh, we will be focusing on those aspects that will be of value 
wherever this would be located. So, for example, working on the IT system, understanding what the specification is required, understanding what the flow of work is from an application form right through to a determination, looking at a payment system, uh, working up what an application uh, form uh, looks like, uh, working through all of those, uh, those, those aspects, getting the protocols and procedures right for, for uh, 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 guiding evidence retrieval and so forth. There's a whole range of things that we can do that will apply no matter where this eventually sits. Uh, but yes, there is a point, and that's why I said 2.5 million. We may not be able to spend it all in the one year because before you would invest some of that money, you would need the clarity over over the designated department. Otherwise, you could potentially be spending it somewhere where it's not going to, going to be needed. So, so that is is uh, uh, an amount of money that we bid for, not knowing precisely when we would have the full go ahead. Yeah. But it covers us if we did get that full go ahead uh, to to ensure we could we, we could we, we could push ahead for the rest of the year. I mean, in the great scheme of things, Mark, you, you, you're, it's not a huge amount of money. I get that. I, I absolutely get that. Two point five million. When we're talking about the startup costs for this thing, um, will probably be one hundred and nine million at the start. So you know, so so, and that's just the starting of it, the first year. So so, it's not a huge amount of money, but it is a scrutiny committee. It is two point five million pounds. It is taxpayers' money. We do have to look at what it's being spent on and make sure it's being spent properly. I I really would not mind getting a copy of, of the work that you're doing in regards to that to that sum, um, because uh, I don't see any reason why a, a lead department can't be nominated, even if the issues have not been sorted. I cannot see the reason why it hasn't been, um, uh, and, and, and I cannot see when these issues are going to be uh, resolved. Have you got anything? I mean, you're talking about if it's not spent this year. Are we saying that we could be still talking about this next year? Is that, is that, I mean, is that just beyond you? Is that... Well, I, I didn't mean to imply that. Well, well, I know you didn't, saying, but, but you uh, are by what you said. Well, I'm just saying that we, that, that, that um, we were seeking that money uh, on the, to allow for the potential for an early decision and full steam ahead. But if it was a slightly later decision, then obviously we couldn't spend the full amount. I wasn't implying any particular date around that. And, and uh, quite honestly, th this is a political matter. This is a matter for ministers, and I can't actually give you any firmer view uh, on, on the designation of the department than I've given you already. Uh, and that's a fair one, Mark, and, and that's why I wouldn't ask you the questions about the legislation in itself or even the guidance note that should be released by the Secretary of State, because they are political issues and they need to put them out, and that would be unfair putting it to yourself. But can I ask you, where are we in regards to the legal action against the Executive Office in regards to this? Do we know? I'll let Gareth. Pick that up because oh, involved in the yeah. detail uh, of that. Yes, yeah. Um, there have been a couple of uh, preliminary hearings that the court has held uh, so far, in, uh, in focusing on two of the cases. There's there's a third one that uh, we'll be joining in, um, and uh, the timetable that they're looking towards is uh, hearings in the week of the 17th of August. So obviously there's a lot of uh, exchanging of skeleton arguments and affidavits and so on that needs to, to uh, go on before then. But uh, that's the timetable that the, the court's looking at. 17th, 17th of August? That, that, that week, yes. They've set aside a few days. And, 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 and we have, you, you say there's two cases at the minute, possibly a third joining it? I think I know if I know two of them. Um, uh, you know, I'll not discuss the third coming in, but you know, the, 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 there could be a pile on here, and quite justly a pile on in regards to all of this, and that's a huge expense. Then, is it not? Um, it's certainly there is a lot of work involved in in responding to uh, judicial reviews, um, but. Uh, you know, the important thing is that we, we put forward the um, department's position, we put forward all the detail, obviously we'll be open about uh, papers and so on that will be, will be disclosed, um, and uh, then the, the court will, will need to do its work. Um, but uh, there's a number of things that we have, uh, even at this early stage, been emphasising through Council, and those include the active efforts that are being made, um, particularly in regard to the finance and the discussions that are happening, as Mark says, at both uh, official and ministerial level. So uh, we've been putting all of that information before the court. Uh, thanks, Gareth. Um, I mean, it's difficult for, for everybody concerned. Can I just ask one last question, please, Chair? Thank you. Um, is there anything, legally or otherwise, which stops the Northern Ireland office from taking this scheme back and administrating it themselves? Is there, is there anything that, within, either within the legislation or within any protocols or within anything else, which stops them saying, do you know what, Westminster legislation, 
we're going to take it back and we're going to administrate it from the Northern Ireland office. Is there anything that stops them? Uh, at the moment, the legislation is framed in that the Executive Office is required to designate a Northern Ireland Department to exercise the administrative functions of the Board on the Board's behalf. Um, so uh, I think there would need to be some change to that piece of the legislation if uh, the Northern Ireland Office were to take on responsibility. So there needs to be a small legislative change if they were to, if they were to do that, and that would be the only obstacle in them doing that? That we, that we know of? I think if that were done, um, then the, the rest of the legislation follows it, as it were. Yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you. Okay. And maybe just following on with the, the, the two and a half million being still an eye popping amount of money, never mind, but small <laughs> in the scheme of things, but yeah. still a large amount of money. Would you undertake to maybe write back to us as a committee and give us a breakdown of what you would envisage that 2.5 million being spent on, and maybe you, you could highlight where it could be very easily transferred over to another department and wouldn't be considered lost if it was progressed now before it then passes to another department? Would that be...? Yeah, happy to respond on that, Chair. And obviously, like any other monies, if, if towards the end of the year the money wasn't being spent through the normal mounting rounds, it would be made, made available elsewhere. OK, that's grand. Thank you. And we go next to Pat, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, uh, gentlemen, for coming in today. Um, just picking up on Doug's point, about the, um, the department uh, who's, who are going to administer this, which is going to administer this. And there was quite a lot of fanfare a while back when it was announced that uh, the Justice Department would take it on. But you're telling us here today that uh, her, the willingness of the minister to take it is conditional on assurances around funding and a, a clear date for implementation. Uh, Is that right? There's been no formal designation of a department, as you know, so uh, 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 there, there had been discussions um, and uh, the, the um, Justice Minister made it clear that if her department was designated, and she did set out some of the issues that she had, uh, like DFC also set out issues they had if it was to come to them, she set out some of those issues but said if it was to come, or if, if her department was to be designated, that uh, she would be prepared to take it on uh, in the interest of victims and survivors subject to the conditions I mentioned about about clarity around the source of funding and the funding being made available and agreement with her as to what the effective date would be to allow for preparations and so forth to be put in place. And has there been any discussion around any other department? I mean, Doug mentioned uh, the Department for Communities. Others have mentioned that the BSS would actually be the best body to administer this scheme. Have discussions taken place around that? Well, at official level, we considered a range of options, which included DFC and which included uh, VSS. They have some concern about, uh, uh, and VSS weren't keen to take it on on the basis that they provide support and they provide services. And if they're, if they're, if they're getting into, into a position where they were determining who may or may not be eligible for a payment, that that could damage that relationship that they have with all victims. Um, the, the Department for, the, for, the, for community Communities um, uh, set out a number of reasons why they felt they weren't the most appropriate department, um, as did the Department of Justice. But those were all just part of our of our discussions, which we have made available to, to ministers. What actually happened was that the the, the Minister of Justice came forward herself uh, in light of the imp imp impasse to say what I just said that if her department was designated as subject to certain conditions, she would be prepared to take it forward. And uh, I suppose one of the difficulties in getting a department to administer this is the lack of clarity around funding. And you have told us previously that there's 109 million pencilled in for the first three years. But you've also said this, in theory, could be a 30-year scheme. And it, it's, it, it's most likely going to be demand-led. It's going to be a lengthy and a complex uh, uh, project. Um, so. In terms of a, of a 30 year project, what, what does the business case say about how much that's going to cost? Well, um, we haven't yet, we're still uh, developing the business case. Uh, there, is, as, there is no business case? There's no business case at the moment. Um, I'm, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting you. Business case. And, and you say we haven't developed a business case or we're in the no. process of developing a business case, but is it not the responsibility? of whoever develops the policy 
to also develop the business case. Yes. That would be the NIO, I presume. Yes. And, and have the NIO a business case? The NIO haven't developed a formal business case. They did some uh, modelling around uh, some potential costs which they've made available, um, but they didn't actually pull together a full business case, which was a point that we we did make at the time uh, in our in our in our in our discussions uh, with officials. But we are looking at uh, the, the range of costs that there might be, with a view to on the assumption that that, that decisions are taken, that that the the range of costs and the source of those costs can be uh, estimated as best as possible. And and I suppose business case would uh, do some sort of modelling also in terms of the eligibility, how many people uh, are likely to be eligible for this scheme. And uh, as I said, it's likely to be demand-led. Uh, if you take, for example, another issue that we've, we've, we've mentioned during our discussions around this, the PSNI hearing loss claim. And initially, that was was just a few individuals making claims around uh, hearing loss as a result of the Chief Constable not providing earmuffs on, on shooting ranges. And uh, from what I hear at the moment, the payout on that is in around 160 to 180 million. Uh, so if uh, if people here hear about it, and, 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 and what happened in that scheme was that as more and more police officers heard about it, uh, they began to apply uh, and they were compensated. And you could imagine something similar happening here. Uh, and particularly around issues of psychological injury or harm. And, and do we have any figures, any ballpark figures about how many people are suffering from psychological injury or harm, both here and across the water? Well, <clears throat> there's quite a lot in, in, in that question, yeah, Pat. Well. You, you asked a number of things in there. So, so first thing, in terms of being demand-led, it's, it, it's, it's not entirely demand-led, but obviously people have to be eligible, and the first, they have to meet the eligibility status, and then it's up, up to them to make an application to come forward. So it's demand-led in that sense, that they have to make an application which can then be considered. And, and they, there has to be permanent disablement, which has to amount to more than 14%, and it has to be related to a trouble to the density. So there are various things around that. Can you give that, us an example of, of what 14% where that level would be? Well, I mean, I'll maybe let Gareth come into that, and I'll maybe finish okay, on the, on the cost, if that's enough, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in terms of, of, of the cost, um, we, we, we um, in discussion with uh, NIO official to get what modelling they had done, uh, we, 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 we looked at the, the basis for, for, for that estimate. That estimate was based on <clears throat> an assumed 2,000 recipients, which was made up of the, the seriously physically injured were, who would currently be receiving support from the VSS. There's just over 500 of those. So th those numbers are, are, are known. Um, added, uh, cou coupled with the, the figures for VSS who are dealing with um, uh, those who are seriously psych psychologically injured, which was another 1,135. That was then up uplifted on the basis that VSS wouldn't be dealing with everybody. The point you made that there are others out there who maybe haven't come forward uh, by 25% to come to, two to 2,000. That's the genesis of the 2,000 figure. Um, now, when that 2,000 figure was worked through by the government actuaries department to take account of the, the full lifespan and <coughs> take account of the range of things, including backdating and including the number of people who would take a lump sum, 10 years, rather than getting it every single year, they make assumptions around that. They also have to make an assumption around what's the, the likely average payment to be. So they, they looked at what was uh, paid through the, uh, the war pension scheme uh, and they modelled that. Uh, and that's the basis for our, the figures that we had and uh, in, in our initial estimates um, for the 109 million over three years. Uh, and if you run that on through, actually, over the course of the scheme, it would be in the region of 165 million pounds. Now, the uncertainties around that are the ones that you alluded to, which is that um, there could well and are likely to be significantly more uh, people with severe psychological uh, uh, injuries who are likely to come forward. We're working with um, a, 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 a psych psychologist in, at Queen's who specialises in this area to try and get some estimates from surveys that have uh, been done. Um, and the, the, the estimate there is that the figures there could be anywhere from 3,500 to um, over 7,000. 
Um, now, we don't know the amount of double counting in that, and those who are already there, but clearly that already indicates the figures could be significantly higher. The other aspect here <clears throat> is that um, there are those who um, are in receipt of a, 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 a war pension, uh, and while they themselves might not um, um, receive a payment on their victim payment, they could be eligible but not get it because they're already getting this other payment, but on their death, uh, they can be, they can nominate or can pass to their spouse, uh, and therefore there's the potential for 10 years. There's the, there's a the potential for the cost to come in, and we don't yet know um, how many people would be in that area. And we're looking at that figure. So the reality is that that 165 million figure uh, is only based on the 2000, and yet the figure could be significantly higher. And that's why we're working to try and get the best estimates we can. But the one caution I would make is we're never going to get really accurate firm estimates here because the figures simply don't exist. They're, these are going to be our best estimates as to, as to the range in which we think these costs might fall. And it's not unlike the historical institutional abuse inquiry in that regard, where we also had a range that we were working within a similar type uh, approach. Gareth, do you want to pick up on the other and, hand? And, and just right. in terms right. of you know the unknowns that exist, uh, I mean, there is the potential for this scheme <coughs> to spiral way beyond what's expected? Um, and would there be a facility within it to close it down if that did happen? The scheme has to be reviewed after after uh, one year after the initial period of two years, I think is right, Gareth, isn't it, in terms of more of the operation of the, the scheme? The operation of the scheme, yes, has to be reviewed. Um, and uh, it, it's a five-year scheme. Applications are open for a five-year period. Um, Though, uh, of course, once you start to provide something to someone through a scheme and then someone else says, well, I'm in that same position, um, you get into issues of fairness and uh, uh, are you um, applying the, the scheme in a, uh, a fair and, and proportionate and regular way across everybody who's... Uh, who's expressed an interest. So um, while there is a formal review, um, I can see that there could be difficulties in you know, absolutely putting a, a guillotine in, certainly for anybody who had their application in by that stage. And um, I, I suppose, I mean, well, first of all, I think there's, there, there, there's agreement around the table here and within the assembly that uh, victims deserve this payment, uh, they need this payment, and it, it should be brought into effect as soon as it possibly can. But we're living in a uh, post-RHI world, and uh, there are all sorts of uncertainties and unknowns uh, within this. And, you know, I suppose... I'm, I'm wondering about governance of this scheme, of due diligence of this scheme. How is it going to be scrutinised? Uh, given the fact that it's going to be a lengthy and a complex scheme, does that not require you know, enhanced scrutiny? Um, uh, you know, uh, and I understand people want to have this implemented as, as soon as possible. And, and, I put the caveat in uh, that I have issues around the eligibility, but even even in terms of the funding and the cost and all of that, there are all sorts of unknowns. There's no business case. There's no certainty around the numbers who are eligible. As a result of that, there's no clarity around how much it's going to cost. Uh, th 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 these issues not concern you much. Absolutely. Uh, 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 right from the start, I, mean, I made the point uh, about the need for a business case and what we've been doing since we got the, the information uh, from NIO was to try and, and look at the figures and try and determine what those costs might be. It's also a matter of concern for ministers who, who clearly want to know uh, what, what the, uh, the costs are and uh, how they actually uh, arise from the different groups that would be eligible here. And this goes back to the, the point we made earlier on about uh, the argument being made that whoever brings forward the policy and legislates for the policy, he should have identified the full costs and should be making provision for those costs to be met. And that takes us back to the heart of this, uh, this political debate uh, around that issue. But there's, there's no doubt that, that, that we need as much clarity as we can get around the costs so that we, and, and, and confidence that they can be uh, funded. Because once the system is set up, 
it will create. And people will die if they're awarded funding, there will be an entitlement to, to receive an award. Uh, and this will become a, a, a call on the, uh, the NI block. Gareth, you were going to come in on something? Uh, uh, I was just, just to say something about um, the, 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 where the eligibility level is um, in terms of physical injury and, and psychological injury, uh, and that's defined in the regulations as 14%. Uh, in the case of physical injury, 14% equates to the loss of an index finger, uh, and that was chosen because and it's the same for the industrial injuries um, scheme. Uh, it was chosen there because of the impact that the loss of an index figure makes on the ability to operate technology, the ability to, to write and so on. Um, so that, that's the, the level on the physical side. Um, on the psychological side, uh, as you might imagine, uh, th there is more discretion. Uh, because something like depression can occur in, in all kinds of different ways, manifest itself in all kinds of different ways. Um, certainly uh, anything that is in the Industrial Injuries Handbook uh, as mild to moderate uh, psychological impact, uh, and that includes uh, occasional panic attacks, mood swings, conflicts with peers and, and co-workers, um, emotional blocking, um, some antisocial behaviour, uh, potentially uh, unexplained absences, few leisure interests and, uh, and hobbies. That is certainly in, um, but there would also be the potential um, for uh, some experiences from the category below that, um, uh, around milder forms of, of depression and the like, um, for them to be over the 14%. That will have to be more of a, a judgment for the healthcare professional. And, and I suppose all of those sort of conditions that you mentioned there, or the symptoms that you mentioned, are they all above this 14% threshold, or is it a combination of those ones that I mentioned would all be, would all be above, um, provided that they are permanent. I mean, that's, that's the basic um, tenet of, of all of this, um, that there is a, a permanent problem there. You see, I, I have a figure that there are over 100,000 people here in the north who are suffering from PTSD, for example. Now, I don't know how much of that is conflict related, but I'm sure there's a fairly sizable percentage of that 100,000. Where their condition is related, is conflict related. I mean, it, it, it just seems to me that uh, there's a, there's a serious underestimation of what this scheme is going to cost, and it, it also seems crazy to me in the context of of our HI that this scheme can move forward until there's a full business case that provides clarity around what's going to be required in terms of funding and who's going to provide that funding. Would you not agree with that? That's the uh, part of the work that the psychiatric consultant Mark mentioned from, from Queen's uh, is, is doing with us, which is about looking at those overall figures uh, for PTSD and then narrowing that down to what was troubles related, what is likely to be over the, the boundary here. And, and Mark has already set out some of the, the thinking on that. So um, that is work that is actively underway to get to a better range of, of, of assumptions. And I think what we'll end up with will be uh, rather as we did on historic institutional abuse, um, where there will be a range of uh, assumptions. Um, looking at the, the likely numbers, looking at the likely amounts of, of payment. Um, I don't think we're, we're ever going to be able to say there is one figure that we uh, you can absolutely rely on, but we'll be able to set out what we think is a reasonable, a reasonable range from, from low to high. Yeah, but I suppose what I'm asking you, Gareth, is how, how do we proceed when we don't have a business case? and we don't have clarity around what it's going to cost or uh, who's going to provide the funding. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm asking you a question. How do we get over these obstacles? How do, how do we move this forward? Well, uh, to take forward any major programme, uh, we have to agree both the funding and there has to be a business case that supports 
uh, the, 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 the need for that funding. Um, so I mean, we are working on a, a business case in this regard. Uh, we haven't yet got clarity over, over the, the, the sorry, source of the funding around that. business case. Who, who's working on the business case? Well, in, in the executive office, we are looking at various aspects of cost to try and inform ministers in their discussions with the, uh, the Secretary of State and the Treasury. But, but um, it is... It is a Important to, to note that uh, certainly the Department of Finance has continued has continued to make the point to um, the Secretary of State um, that really this is something that they feel should have followed the policy and uh, should have been undertaken uh, in uh, in Whitehall. I, I suppose, well, and this is my final comment. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, sorry about that. Uh, that victims have had their their hopes raised that there was a scheme sort of pre-prepared, ready to go into the oven, it's going to take a short while to cook it and take it out again, and then people would get this payment. It's much, it, it, it appears to be much more complicated than that, and, and it seems to be we're in a fairly lengthy process. Uh, it's going to require, in your own words, Mark, very significant funding. Uh, and I suppose that's a comment, uh, Chair, more than anything, rather than a question. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, I give a bit of latitude there to, to Pat, because there were questions, but if we can try and keep our questions, maybe bunch them together and, and get the responses, I'll, I'll pass on to yourself. I know you're very eloquent at doing that, Trevor. Why, why do you pick on me? <laughs> <laughs> well, no. Gareth, just before I leave the question of disability and the level of disability, would the 14% apply to hearing loss claims as well? Um, uh, yes. Uh, now, let me just see if there is specific mention of... Um, I don't see specific mention of uh, hearing loss just here. There is certainly loss... Well, at 30% would be loss of vision in one eye. 40% uh, would be loss of one eye. Um, so that the, yeah, the, the uh, hundred percent loss of uh, sight uh, to such an extent as to render the claimant unable to perform any work. Sorry, I, I tell a lie. Uh, no, hundred percent would also be absolute deafness. Would be regarded yeah. as hundred percent disablement. And um, so yes, if there were hearing loss um, short of absolute deafness, um, that will that may come somewhere within the 14% and 100%, it would be a matter of a, a medical assessment. Yeah, well, but without wanting to deny anybody availability or access to the scheme, um, I think half the population probably suffers from 14% hearing loss. Uh, Actually, at my age. <laughs> well, um, well, well if, you, if you spot what's in my ear, you'll, uh, you'll realise right, it's, uh, it's not just people your age. Okay. Um, the, the, the question of the lead department, um, I imagine if we had this source of funding uh, decided and the eligibility question decided, that the lead department wouldn't be too hard to, to work out. Um, I'm going back to the previous discussions that we had, and we've had two with the Victim and Survivors Service since. Um, <coughs> frankly, not, nothing has moved on, nothing at all. We're having the same conversation now as what we would have had with you a number of months ago. And that's no criticism of yourselves. You're, you made the point perfectly rightly that, that most of these decisions are political. You're doing what you can as officials, and I wouldn't criticise you at all. But the, in terms of the sources of funding, the, I imagine our executive, the Northern Ireland Office, the Westminster Government, the Secretary of State, goodness knows who else, was involved in settling this and, and putting together legislation. Is, is there nothing in the records of what happened? I mean, I know civil service keeps brilliant records. Is, is there nothing there to indicate who was supposed to pay for this? It, it just seems incredible to me. We could even get to the point we have now, and we still don't know how the, the cost will be absorbed. Who will be the lead? Who will it be shared? Uh, is, is there nothing at all in, in the records that would indicate that somebody, some department or the NIO perhaps was supposed to be saddled with the cost? Well, there 
were comments made that the funding would come from the Northern Ireland Bloc at an early stage, but that doesn't actually answer the entire question, because while it may come from the Northern Ireland Bloc, uh, that doesn't answer the question of whether there be any enhancement to the Northern Ireland Bloc in order to allow the Northern Ireland Bloc to be able to afford to pay it. Uh, so there wasn't the clarity that you're talking about, uh, Trevor, uh, uh, in, all, in, all, in all of this. The, the, I think the repeated assertion from my recollection is that this will come from the Northern Ireland Bloc. Um, but I still left the question begging as to whether that was the Northern Ireland Bloc. Well, well, was there more money coming in for it or not? Or how much more money was coming <coughs> in and how was it being shared? And that, that would mean that our our political masters here didn't think to inquire as to what that meant. And it's just, it's, I can see now where the, the problem is coming from. You say Northern Ireland Bloc and people make assumptions about that. But if, if it's going to come out of the existing Northern Ireland Bloc and it's unquantifiable, as Pat rightly says at the moment, it could go on for 30 years. And there's no way that a, a lead department here, but justice perhaps, could, could ever take it on without having much more assurance than that that it's going to come out of the Northern Ireland Bloc and the Bloc might be increased a bit to, to take care of it. It's just, it's just not, this isn't proper government, you know, it's not proper preparation. And it's very frustrating that we're having the same discussion as we've had many times. I suppose the, part of the background is that this was made at a time when there were no local ministers. Uh, under the EFEF Act, and it, it was made uh, in, 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 in the context of the, uh, the extension of the, of the EFEF Act in Westminster when a range of things were added to mm. that through amendments, and they were made in a, in a fairly pacey way, uh, and there was a, a head of steam to have things and, uh, uh, included in that, um, and uh, the fine detail, uh, as you've described, wasn't, wasn't uh, uh, worked through. So in, in terms of blame of lack of lack of foresight, our executive ministers are off the hook really, aren't they? The NIO that uh, put this together with Westminster. Well, the, I'm not trying to point at, 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 at any particular administration. All I can say is the facts are that this was Westminster <coughs> legislation that was um, brought forward uh, th uh, through, 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 through Westminster uh, and um, to a timetable determined by Westminster. And there's been no progress, this is the last one, Chair, in case you're getting worried here. They, they, no progress on eligibility at all, or exceptions. Well, we don't yet have any published guidance. Uh, I know that there's been work done on, on draft guidance, which has been, I think, has been shared with some of the parties, but there's been no final uh, agreement on uh, that guidance, and it hasn't been made available publicly. Uh, yeah. Chair, I should just clarify what I was saying on uh, hearing loss. Uh, the hear any claim for hearing loss, it would have to relate to a troubles-related incident that that was what had caused the, the hearing loss. Just to uh, to emphasise that. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, I would have assumed that, you know. But I'm, I'm thinking of, sorry, Chair, I'm thinking of people who have never previously indicated that they had any problems arising from. A troubles related incident and we go back a lot of other people never bothered never consulted their doctor or anything else and certainly on the psychological side on the psychiatric yeah. side there could be people who have lived with it and uh, haven't particularly sought help until now yeah. um, Emma. thank you chair and thank you to you both for your presentation i just have two short questions um so the first you're talking there about eligibility and both of my questions relate to eligibility um, you talk there about um, having a fair and proportionate and equitable um, scheme. So the example of Christy Cummings, um, someone that was injured and paralysed in an LVF attack, being ruled out based on the fact that he had been a Republican prisoner prior to this, does that fall into a fair and equitable scheme, in your opinion? I mean, there's... there's a thought out there that the British government are trying to change the, the definition of a victim by stealth here. Is that something that you would comment on? Well, on an individual case, it's not something I would want to comment on, um, Emma. Um, there be other examples like that, obviously. In the generality of what was being considered around eligibility, um, there was the... the um, 
issue about, about whether there was a spent or, un or unspent conviction uh, relevant to the um, the incident that that occurred, or whether there were other exceptional circumstances uh, that should be taken into account by the uh, the uh, president of the um, of the board in that regard. Um, but until we have the guidance, we don't know how that's going to be interpreted, um, because there could well be mitigating circumstances uh, as to whether someone's uh, um, been engaged uh, uh, in, in, in activity since or not. Um, and there's a range of things. But so we actually, I can't answer your question. I couldn't answer it in that specific case, because I don't think that would be appropriate. In the general terms, I can't answer it, because we don't have the guidance from the NIO, and this is something that NIO have to provide. A concern that people have obviously around the scheme. I just have one more question. Also in terms of eligibility, it looks like um, anyone injured in the 26 counties, unless they were born in the north of Ireland or were uh, a British citizen at the time of their injury or acting in, in defence of the British state, that they would be ineligible. But then obviously the criteria sets out that this is for victims of conflict-related violence. And there are examples of conflict-related violence that happened in the South, the, the most notable examples, the likes of the Dublin Monaghan bombings. So those people, would any, anyone injured in, in events such as those would be ruled out? Would, would that be accurate? Do you want to pick that one up? Um, yes, yes. Um, <coughs> it's, uh, yeah, it, it, it's where the incident um, occurred in the UK um, or uh, anywhere in Europe if the person is a, a British citizen or in the, the service of the, the Crown. So um, uh, yes, there, there are examples there you're giving that wouldn't be, wouldn't be covered. So that probably is unfair given the remit of the scheme. Well, the, 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 those are um, the current provisions in the scheme. As I say, the scheme is one that's, that uh, has been, uh, in terms of the regulations, has been provided to us in terms of impl imp implementation, uh, and then any any uh, um, to be taken forward by um, <coughs> the NIO. So uh, our our position at the minute is in terms of implementing that scheme, and we can only explain what the scheme is. Um, but that that understanding is your understanding as well, then. It it's the it's set out in full. Um, it, it, I mean, I could read the whole thing out, yeah. but it, it's set out in full um, in uh, Regulation Five C Two. Yeah, five C two. Uh, which so it's either in the United something that happened in the United Kingdom or something that happened in Europe where the applicant was a British citizen was a person okay. born in Northern Ireland uh, having at the one time uh, and having at the time of their birth at least one parent who is a British citizen, an Irish citizen, or is otherwise entitled to reside in Northern Ireland without any restriction on the period of residence, um, or thirdly, was outside the United Kingdom in the service of the Crown, uh, or was a com an accompanying close relative of a person serving outside the United Ser Kingdom in the, the, the service of the Crown. So there is a, a, a quite complex uh, definition there, but, but uh, as I say, there are some of those examples that you've been given that uh, uh, that wouldn't fall within that. Thank you, Chair. I suppose I would take issue with the terminology of uh, complex um, in relation to how you describe that. I would describe it as exclusionary. It seems like anybody who's Irish uh, should not apply. Um, obviously, we're all very disappointed that the, the scheme has not commenced, and I know the Vice President of Sinn Féin the Joint First Minister, uh, Michelle O'Neill, has been very clearly expressing her, her disappointment with regards to that. But I think just based on what my colleague has just said there in relation to we need the issues of the exclusion and the contradictions and also um, some, some information I think that's, uh, that's imparted today that's worth teasing out further, particularly um, Rafilin when, when uh, my colleague Potts question was answered about there being no business case um, 
provided by, by the NIO. I think many people would be surprised at this stage of this conversation and where things are at out there and the expectations that we still don't have a business case. And then we're being told the Department of Justice and the Department of Communities have both said they're not able to take it on. And whilst the Minister has said in terms of the Minister of Justice, it's just willing. But the, uh, what she had set out in the criteria um, to administer it um, has been very clear that there needs to be clear agreement that the funding is in place. And so, Mark, when I was listening to you, and I was trying to do rough calculations in my head, so forgive me if I write my figures, I'm probably not 100% accurate, but when you were talking about the psychological and the physical damage and the criteria, the application of the criteria, when we're dealing with 30 plus years of resources, I just wondered, are, are we looking at somewhere in the figure between you know, 700 to 900 million? as opposed to the initial figure of, uh, of 165 of the guesstimation, once you start to add in the possibilities of, of who may, may be able to, to apply for this. And even though it has been mentioned that the British government has said it has brought forward this legislation um, and it's up then to the executive to pay the financial, uh, the financial bill for this, um, I've been very clear about comments made by the Council of Europe, Human Rights Commissioner Niels Muzniak in relation to the legacy of the conflict, given that the 30 plus years of that conflict was done under uh, British direct rule being the responsibility. And he actually said that the British government could not wash their hands of legacy. So it's in that, when I look at the criteria and the eligibility, based on what I've been hearing today, British Paris, who came into uh, my hometown of Derry and murdered people on the streets of Derry and wounded many others, that those Paris who may be suffering from some kind of uh, maybe PTSD or some kind of psychological uh, impact um, because of whatever, um, they could apply and be eligible for this scheme. But the innocent people who were on the streets campaigning on Bloody Sunday, um, they, they were those that were injured and those who were shot at, let alone those who were murdered. Uh, those people, have they, if they have reacted and ended up in, in prison as a consequence of that, would not fall into the eligibility criteria. And then when I've been listening to the psychological effect, and you've talked about hearing large loss and others, you know, mood swings and, and everything else. So... We could have a situation where prisoners who were tortured, well-documented torture, uh, recognised in, in European courts and elsewhere, um, that those prisoners would not be eligible, but the tortured wouldn't be eligible, but the torturers would. So um, is that what we're dealing with here in terms of eligibility? And therefore, going back to the question that, that my colleague had asked, about really the exclusionary nature of uh, and why people are are looking and, and interrogating this scheme now in terms of its application and how it's been dealt with by by the British government. That's my first question. Then I, I would like to ask another one resource. Well, we'll try and pick up the bits we can. The first thing I would have to repeat is this is Westminster legislation, uh, or legislation passed in Westminster, which has been implemented here. Uh, the executive office uh, uh, role in this is to um, uh, uh, implement the legislation. Um, the 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 uh, the scheme is as it is, um, and, and all we can do as officials is try and explain what we understand the scheme to be. And in, in, in relation to some of the questions you asked, Martina, about who would be eligible and who who wouldn't be, it, it some of that will depend on the nature of the advice uh, that comes forward on eligibility. Uh, which has not yet been published by the NIO. Um, so it'll depend on, on the, the advice and guidance that is given there as to who precisely will fall in um, uh, in, in terms of some of the categories that you just uh, uh, identified. Uh, in terms of the costs, um, the, the 165 million I referred to is 2000 right over the entire period of their lives. So it actually runs up to, I think it runs up to year 55 or 56. Very few are still likely to be claiming at that point, but it runs the whole way through. So the issue then is how many more would come in over and above 
the 2000. And the answer is, at this point in time, we don't know precisely. We're still doing those estimates. And um, the work that we're doing uh, with the um, uh, psychiatrists at Queen's is, 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 is based on a number of studies. Uh, one's an iron health and stress study, and the other's uh, the, the, uh, what's called the, the Nicola uh, study. Um, and coming from those two angles, trying to get an estimate of how many people would, would uh, suffer from severe psychological uh, uh, disorder mm -hmm. um, who might come in there. So, and that's where the difference will come from the 120,000 that Pat mentioned earlier on, who are estimated to suffer from PTSD to those who would be eligible in the scheme. So there's, there is more detailed information available, but at the end of the day, there are surveys. Um, we can only get uh, population <coughs> estimates, and some of them may already be counted in some of the earlier figures. We just don't know. Uh, and then there's the issue about the, about the war pension. So really, the total cost is going to depend on how many uh, there are in those categories and how many come forward and again as I said about around the um, the nature of the uh, assessment um, so it, costings are, are difficult here uh, there's nothing else I can say than that uh, but we're doing our best to try and clarify the costs as much as we can well can I just just come back on that one because it, it, de it deals with the issue of resources and uh, and what was said here about 30 years 30 plus years um, of, of resources Given then, in the absence of robust data, because you're still in the point of collating and collecting that data, and the projections alongside the 30 years of financial uh, certainty, it's really hard to see how you can realistically proceed, despite the, um, what, what has been presented to people out there and the expectations and people's understanding of where we are. Quite clearly, today, today exposes that we're nowhere near where people thought we were at with the scheme. So it's hard to see how you can, given that we don't have those, those projections, you know, as, as officials, to, to be able to give advice to ministers with some degree of certainty. Well, it's difficult for you, to, it must be, at this moment in time to do that, given that you don't have the, a robust financial um, data to be able to give an assessment to, to, to ministers and to go back to the minister who said that she was quite clearly prepared to take this on providing you had the particular conditions in place and this is part of the conditionality attached to her, her pursuing that. So we're not even near being able to progress that because we don't have that information. Well, in, in terms of the uh, <clears throat> certainty of uh, costing, it's, it's, it's true to say that we don't know what the, the cost will be and I think it'll be true to say that until we actually the costs are met, we won't know what the cost will be. This is one of those issues and it's not unique. I mean, it is similar to HIA, we've mentioned that before, in that we don't know exactly how many people are, are eligible, we don't know how many will come forward, the and Department we don't know... The Department of Justice, the Minister said she needs the funding and costing nailed down before she will take this on, so that's part of the conditionality that she is asking for. I think what she's looking for is, is, is confidence that the cost will, will be met. Yeah. Um, uh, and that's not quite the same as having it all nailed down. Um, but um, you know, it's, it's not a unique circumstance to be in a situation where we, you're not absolutely precise about what the costs actually are. Obviously, you want to be as sure as you can be, and then become, it, it becomes a political judgment as to whether you want to move ahead with a scheme of the nature uh, that it is with the uncertainty of, of the costs. But there's a big differential. Case can only set out there's a big, the there's a big differential, Mark, between 165 million and potentially 800 million. Absolutely, and we, so, uh, I'm not saying 800 million. You wouldn't million, leave but it as a gap like that. You would want to have it at least as tight as you could get it in well, your presentation to ministers. Absolutely, and that's what we're working at to try. And we're we're yeah, saying that 165 that, million is, is, in our view, a low figure. Uh, there yeah. are likely to be more here. We just mm -hmm. are not sure exactly how many, how much more, and that's that's part of the work that, that we're doing to inform ministers in this discussion. Yeah, so it's given. It's at this moment in time, you couldn't say to a minister, any minister, well, you know, you should take that on, but we really don't know what the overall cost will be. But somebody somewhere should pay for this in terms of the executive. But the British government is saying that they'll do a points as pilot on it, and it's not going to cover the cost. It's going to be coming out of the executive funding, so it might have to come out of other commitments that have been made as we come out of post COVID. 19 around hospitals and everything else because we don't have the figure at this moment in time. If it's 165 million, then that's a low estimation, and it could be as high as 800 million. Then you know that that's something that ministers, and I'm sure the minister, whoever he or she may be at the end of this, would be administrating this, would want to know. Absolutely, uh, and we'll be doing our best to give them the best advice we can with the limitations of the data. Uh, the What's the, the time day, frame for that, we'll that work that being done? Um, 
We're with working on as fast as we can. I can't give you a precise time frame because we're working with uh, others outside and we're relying on, on, on the data they can give us. We would hope to be concluded. Uh, or we have firmed up maybe a uh, month well, or so? I think we're talking weeks, yes. We yeah. yes. So it'll be concluded by the time in terms of September? Well, we we will have latest. as clear an estimate as we can have, probably. In a few weeks. A few weeks. I, I'm not saying we'll have a nailed down figure because I don't think we're ever going to have a nailed down figure. Mm, just chair, it'd be good to keep an eye on that then if it's a few weeks. Okay, Christopher. Thank you. And <clears throat> thank you for your answers thus far. Um, can I ask just in very broad and general terms, one, how close we are to an outcome with Treasury on the cost, and two, what is that outcome likely to be? For it appears to me. <laughs> as though we have our position, they have theirs, and never the twain shall meet. I think you've asked Are me there two... any positive <clears throat> signs? <laughs> you've asked me two almost impossible questions, Christopher. Um, the, the first one, uh, um, I, I can't say when an answer will be taken. What I can say is what I said at the start, which is that uh, both First and Deputy First Minister are very keen <coughs> that a resolution is, is reached to this because uh, they want the scheme to go ahead, but clearly there are concerns about it. So there is the political desire to get this uh, moved ahead, and there has been engagement with the Secretary of State, uh, and I think there's an ongoing engagement um, uh, with the Secretary of State. Um, so I think the, the, the desire is there to move this on. It is one of the, one of the, the hottest political topics at the moment, uh, clearly. Um, in terms of what the, the, the outcome will be, um, Again, I, I can't tell you uh, what, what the outcome that's going to be, be the, the uh, re result of, the, of a political negotiation. Um, however, uh, again, uh, when this was debated in Westminster, there was, a, there was a strong desire in Westminster for this scheme to go through. So there's political, there's political support in Westminster for, for a scheme to go through. There's political support here. Um, so the, the, the conditions are there for some sort of agreement to be reached. Whether it will be reached and when it will be reached and what the precise nature of that will be, I honestly couldn't say. I remember at the time some people who were angry about this that went through Westminster were perfectly happy with other measures that went through Westminster, but that's a discussion for a different day. Can I ask, has any progress been made <coughs> in the Republic of Ireland providing an equivalent scheme for people who were victims there? Are you aware of anything? Uh, I, I'm not, not aware of uh, anything, no. Uh, I know the question has been raised, but I'm, I'm not aware of any response. OK. Um, can I ask, in terms of just some practical outworkings, what level of psychological impact will qualify? Now, this might have been asked while I was out of the room, but what level of psychological impact will qualify? And how does one demonstrate that because you know yourself you know 30 40 years ago people had very different attitudes in terms of mental health it was pull yourself together and get on with it and people didn't go to doctors or, or seek help so I'm just wondering what the level of psychological impact will have to be and how is that quantified uh, Daryl will have the detail. Uh. Yes. Um, the, uh, the areas that, that uh, certainly are within scope and 20% and, and above were, were some of those that I, I set out a little bit earlier um, around, um, for example, occasional panic attacks and mood swings, uh, very few or no friends, conflicts with peers and, and co-workers, uh, emotional blocking or tension. Um, some antisocial behaviour, perhaps a um, few leisure interests and, and hobbies. So there's a, a definition there that, that's certainly 20% and above. Um, there is then a definition uh, which is 11 to 20% and it would be a decision for the uh, healthcare professional whether someone fell above the 14%. The and all of this, as I say, is about, is about permanent conditions. Um, so uh, some of the... Uh, aspects in that 11 to, to 20 would be anxiety, occasional panic disorders, uh, depression or flat mood, uh, tense and irritable, um, repeated um, uh, actions like checking that, that taps are off and so on that interfere with, with social and occupational act activities. So there's a, there's a definition there that uh, the healthcare professional would, would take into account. Um, in, in terms of how the assessment will be made, um, we want to rely as much as possible 
um, when the scheme goes on existing information um, because if you can avoid having to put people um, into situations where there are new assessments to be done um, that all relates to uh, avoiding re-traumatisation for, okay. for, for victims and survivors. Um, so if there is good existing information in health records, uh, the board will obtain that. Um, that will be fed through to the healthcare professional and a uh, decision as far as possible made on that basis. We think that for uh, a number of those who have been physically injured, certainly, uh, whose condition is well documented and they have been seeing professionals over a, a long period of time, uh, there will be plenty of records there um, and, and that shouldn't be an issue. But as you say, uh, there will be those, and we think there will likely be more on the, the psychological injury side, who haven't consulted uh, people professionally, there will be arrangements that will be available to them um, to see a healthcare professional, to have a full assessment done uh, and for a decision to, to be reached. So um, they won't be disadvantaged, um, but uh, you know, obviously there will need to be a process there that for others where there are good records wouldn't need to happen. Just one of the concerns that I would have, as I say, um, you know, when Belfast was getting the guts bombed out of it. People just cleared up, cleaned the streets, and went back to life as normal and carried on. And I think there's, particularly among men, I think there's an attitude about seeking help that exists independently of, of yeah. this issue in terms of mental health. So if someone has never been to a health professional and there's nothing in their medical records on that you're saying that there is a, a process in place to make an assessment there and i presume it's about getting them through that process as quickly as possible yes uh, though also i think it's uh, important and this is something that we've been talking to the the uh, victims and survivors service and the victim sector is about about that we don't see this scheme simply uh, as in isolation um, there is a wide range of support that is available for victims and survivors, uh, right from the uh, level of, of you know, social and emotional support um, and uh, activities through to professional services like uh, cognitive behavioural therapy and, uh, and other forms of therapy. Um, so uh, certainly anybody who is making an application to this scheme, you would want to make sure that they are aware uh, that an assessment for those services is very uh, easily ob obtainable um, and uh, access to those services is very easily obtainable. Um, and that even if they go through this and at the end of it, uh, come out and there's not a payment to be made, uh, that at least they have been offered the opportunity to access the forms of, uh, of support um, that maybe they haven't had available to them previously but would benefit from. I had two friends in my primary school class. Their fathers were policemen. Both of them were murdered. Their mothers were obviously will qualify for this. Um, I just want to know, will the pension die with the person who qualifies for it, because I can assure you, uh, one of them was seven and the other one was nine when this happened. And I can assure you that <laughs> they were every bit as traumatized as their, their mother was. And I'm just wondering, is there some means whereby they will qualify for some form of payment? Um, well, uh, not knowing the, the specific cases, but but in, in, in this kind terms. of yeah, in general terms, um, there. Uh, well, first of all, there's the question about uh, might they qualify themselves if they arrived on that you were there at the time or arrived in the immediate Animals. aftermath. Of, One of them was. Yeah, yeah. So there's question of do they qualify for themselves? Um, however, there is also uh, a. Um, survivor benefit that's built into the, the scheme um, so that when someone passes away, um, their spouse or, or partner, uh, or if someone has been uh, caring for them, um, about 35 hours a week is, is the um, standard level, though the board has a bit of discretion there. Um, 
or yeah, so spouse or civil partner, cohabiting partner, or if it's someone who has been giving care, um, then there's the opportunity for uh, that person to be nominated and to receive 10 years of benefit after the, uh, the first person has died. Thank you. I'm going to pass now to um, the two that are joining us remotely. If they have any questions, I'll just confirm with them. So I'll go first to George there, who we can see. George, do you have any questions that you want to ask? Uh, yes, Chair. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks very much. Thanks to Mark and Gareth <clears throat> for uh, coming along today. Um, two or three questions. <clears throat> the first one, Martina mentioned there that the <clears throat> Bloody Sunday situation was in very few years ago. And I thought, maybe I'm wrong, <clears throat> I thought that they, you know, some of the victims already had, had been compensated. Does it mean that they can be compensated again, you know, um, from this scheme here? And um, a couple of other questions, just from <clears throat> another man. Uh, but there's been people in, injured recently from dissidents. Do they, do they fall into this uh, scheme as well? And I, I would like to think that you know, it's the genuine people that will be compensated. <clears throat> For example, somebody who was out to throw a bomb, they have a bomb in their hand, the bomb goes off prematurely, they get their hand blew, blown off. And I don't think, personally speaking, I don't think that person should, should qualify for, the, for compensation, quite honestly. They're right to do harm, they're not another human being. The, those people there should be excluded. On the scheme, and that's my pers personal opinion. I'm not, not really try <clears throat> to bring politics or anything into it, but I'm just speaking, per speaking personally. That's a, a couple of the questions that uh, I think Mark <clears throat> or Gareth can answer. Okay, we'll pass well, back over to the panel. Yeah, well, maybe in the first instance, uh, in, in terms of, of compensation that's been awarded under other schemes, that, that can be taken into account by the, uh, the, the board. Um, in doing that, they will take account of uh, how much was received, how long ago uh, it was, and if there are any other factors they deem to be relevant. So it wouldn't necessarily be double compensation. Uh, that would be something that the panel uh, would have to uh, consider. Um, do you want to pick up on the, 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 the other one, the more recent uh, um, attacks? That's also the, in terms of the date parameters that can be considered yes, yes. by the panel, Gareth. Yeah. Um, the the uh, the panel has the discretion um, to uh, extend those date parameters in an individual case if all the other circumstances are satisfied. Uh, so if this was a, a troubles related incident, uh, if the uh, person was uh, present or in the immediate aftermath uh, and all those other uh, eligibility requirements are satisfied, but the only thing that's missing is it was outside the date parameters, uh, the panel has discretion to admit the case. Yes, maybe one example so well documented case in recent times, the, the journalist up in London Derry, um, from the distant point of view, with the compensation there, and that, that's only an example that I'm given. I didn't hear the question. I, I, could you go again, George, maybe a bit louder? Yes, I'm talking about the, the most recent um, murder of the journalist in London Derry in the, you know, the last couple of years or so, um, by dissidents, would, would there be compensation there? You know, for, 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 for. Isn't the, the panel as to whether it met those particular circumstances, Gareth? Yes, Is yes. Right? No, well, I think one thing just to, to note, because that was a murder, uh, this, is, this scheme is about uh, people who have been uh, injured and, and have some degree of permanent disablement. Uh, I know there is a separate question about people who were bereaved, uh, and uh, we have actively been discussing with the sector uh, what needs to be done for what more might need to be done for uh, people who have been bereaved, uh, and we'll be putting recommendations to, to ministers very shortly. Um, but if it had been a case where someone had been injured and permanently disabled uh, outside the, the date parameters, then what I was saying would, would apply. The board would have discretion. Do the psychological 
entrepreneur from the family's point of view as well. So that would, that would, yeah, that, that would apply whether the injury was uh, physical or psychological. Yes. That's fine. That's grand. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, George. And then finally, Trevor, um, do you have any questions that you would like to ask? Thanks, Chair, for calling in. Probably more an observation. Um, I suppose, for me, I would just like to see the, the scheme rolled out and those who deserve the payments to get, uh, the money that they're due and have a long wait up for. But I suppose it's an observation that some people in the committee today are more angst at the fact that some of their so-called so comrades aren't getting. But I have to say, they never deserved it in the first place where they were the victim makers. But no, I'm content enough with what I heard today. Okay, thank you very much, Trevor. Um, okay, okay, maybe if I could just conclude. Um, just, I suppose it's been, obviously, we've had references today to RHI and the importance of making sure that schemes are completely, you know, w well assessed and well prepared and, and well examined. And I suppose the mention of a lack of a business case in, in some respects would be worrying in that. But is it possible to develop a business case in the absence of the eligibility criteria? I mean, how... You know, one really an eligibility criteria would determine how many people can access it and then how much it's going to cost. But if you don't have the eligibility criteria, can you do the business case? Well, <clears throat> it adds another uh, aspect of uncertainty into your estimates. Um, you, I mean, in a, in, a, in, a, in a business case, you can set out um, with as much certainty as you can what you think costs are going to be, and you can put your assumptions out clearly. Uh, and uh, then it becomes a matter of, of assessing whether you've taken full account of all the various factors and whether uh, a minister or others are prepared to live with the degree of uncertainty that there is at the end of the day in the business case. So uh, eligibility and the clarification of that will certainly be helpful to us in, 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 in being able to clarify more clearly or, or to a greater extent what the numbers are you could still do a business case without that, but it just brings greater uncertainty. You'd have to say it could be X percent higher uh, because of the, the lack of clarity over eligibility. So it doesn't make it any easier, Chair. I think that's the So we, 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 there needs to be conclusion on the eligibility to be able to fulfil an equation that works out with more certainty how much it's going to cost. And then after that, the conversation is going to be about... Who picks that up? Well, I, th that I, th I think the other point is a business case keeps being developed. You know, you can have the, you have the initial business case, and then as things are clearer, you 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 refine down the costs uh, until the scheme is actually being implemented. And there was um, no business case at all at the beginning. There was no business case provided, um, and um, there were there were those estimates that we talked about based on the two thousand. Okay. I suppose, Chair, if you don't mind me just coming in, I mean, it's a very difficult position for officials, and I acknowledge this. I mean, this is. This was developed by the NIO, uh, by the British government, and it shouldn't be up to officials to second guess what they wanted as that policy uh, and try to develop a business case on that basis. Uh, I just think it's, you know, it's, this is unheard of. Uh, and it, it's, it's actually causing distress to victims the way it has been developed uh, and the, the shambolic way it has been developed, uh, if you ask me. Well, look, if you officials, if you can bring back to the executive office that the committee would like to see the, the scheme as quickly as possible, but I would like to see it done uh, in a way that, that removes as much of the uncertainty as possible and that that will certainly involve uh, resolving the issue of the eligibility criteria, which would certainly enable yourselves to progress and move a lot further forward. Thank you very much for both of your attendance today. We kept you a little bit longer, but we've reduced the number uh, of panels that come in front of us so that we can get longer to, to discuss with you. <laughs> <laughs> so we're doing. I thank you for that, and, and we'll yeah. take a moment just to let you um, head on there. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Right. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Okay, so Doug, you want to go yeah, back could, that? Could, could I just ask off the back of that, if there's any chance we could ask the Executive Office for the correspondence between them and uh, the Department for Justice and the Department for the Economy, because, uh, for the community okay. side? Because I've seen the response, I've seen the letter from the Department for Justice where the Justice Minister outlines what she will and will not accept, mm -hmm. but I haven't seen what the TEO have replied to that to say 
this is what we're. I mean, if I read it out to you, it's just uh, you know, so, so you have an idea what I'm saying. And this is a, within the last paragraph of this letter from the Justice Minister to uh, the TEO. It says, therefore, if the TEO decide that my department should be de designated to administer the scheme, I will take that word that word forward. That would only be on the basis of clear agreement that the funding for the scheme and its administration would be in place, and that a new date was agreed with me for the delivery of the scheme put in place prior to transfer. It would also be important that responsibility for making decisions regarding the delivery of the scheme also be passed to the Department of Justice and not simply a delivery mechanism for decisions reached by the TEO. And that concerns me in that last sentence where it says um, that DOJ um, will be responsible for decision making around the scheme. Surely the whole point is a lead administration department. They are the delivery mechanism only. So it would be interesting to see what the, the um, executive office responded to, to that. We can certainly um, ask for copies of that correspondence. Um, something else that was said was about there was probably be more information available maybe in August time um, in terms of more robust financial data. Um, do you want to arrange an oral briefing for sort of the end of September? To I, th I, I, I think, I think um, Pat, some, some really good points there, and we need to understand what they're doing in mm -hmm. regards to the monies with this. You know, this is, this is eye-watering money, never mind 2.5 million, you're right. But we are talking about lots of money yeah. here, um, and I've got no clarity on it whatsoever. So is there agreement then to organise another oral evidence session in, yeah, I think in so. September. There seems to be agreement to bring them back as soon as we can in, uh, in this September. And to, request. To get, and we will ask for that information, of information on, the, mm. on that letter on the 2.5. Yes. Martina? Um, even though Doug is asking those questions and, uh, and it's good to get that in information so that we have it in front of it, I think from what we heard today, it's going to be really difficult to designate um, a department. That's not going to be simple because there's a lack of financial mo modelling. So we need to ask the question about the financial model modelling. We need um, an informed assessment of how much uh, the scheme will cost. And I also would like to know the level of engagement that has taken place with the TEO you know, before, during and after this legislation uh, went through because I don't think we have uh, had that information given to us um, as a committee. Okay. The members, if we are content with that, then we can move on then to item five, which is the forward work programme, which is on page 45 of the meeting pack. Um, members, a meeting of the Specialised Committee on the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol has been scheduled for the 16th of July. Um, I'm going to suggest that a formal committee meeting uh, of ourselves is convened on the 29th of July and that officials are asked to attend to update members on the outcome of the Specialist Committee and other Brexit issues as a single item agenda for the meeting. Are members yeah. content if we do that on the 29th of July? Yeah. Same time? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, also, that can I ask members that, uh, to respond to the clerk with details of the proposed strategic priorities to allow preparation for the strategic planning meeting on the 9th of September? Or we'll make it a double agenda item on that date on the 29th mm -hmm. and add an extra hour and a half to discuss our specialised discussions and what we want to do. If you could just email in three items to the clerk, we'll pull them together and then that allows us in September mm -hmm. to have something to discuss. Yeah, we're going to be discussing okay. that later and we'll do that. Um, we have uh, already agreed that uh, intensive scrutiny of Brexit issues will be one of our strategic priorities and a schedule for scrutiny is currently being prepared by the clerk for consideration at our strategic meeting in September. The draft schedule includes taking evidence from UK Minister Michael Gove on the protocol and the relevant structures. Our members content that the clerk now starts to prepare for that given that it may take a number of weeks or maybe even a few months to secure time mm. and we can update members whenever we get that meeting arranged. Yeah. Yeah. If that's the case, are members content to note the forward work programme? Mm. Okay. Uh, in terms of item six, correspondence, um, there are nine items of correspondence in the meeting pack and five in the table pack. Just to draw your attention to one or two of them, item 6.9 at page 85 is correspondence from an individual regarding the housing executive properties. Uh, I suggest that we pass that on to the department or the committee for communities, as it's an issue to do with the department for communities. Are we happy enough with that? Yep. Yeah. 
Uh, item 10 at page 5 is a copy of correspondence from the Committee of Justice to the First Deputy First Minister requesting further information regarding arrangements to administer the Victims Payment Scheme. Uh, can I suggest that the Committee requests uh, to be copied into the responses to the Committee for Justice? Yes. Okay. Are you content to note the rest of the uh, items and correspondence? You could probably tell the Committee of Justice that the Ministers are looking for that information as well and still waiting on it. So it's not that the Ministers are holding on to it, the Ministers haven't received it. Okay, item 7, Chairman's Business, just to inform members that it's normal practice for committees to delegate authority to Chairperson and Deputy Chairperson during periods of recess to submit views on the releasing or withholding of information in any known routine or contentious FOI requests received. If any such requests are received, the committee will be advised of the request, including the views expressed by the Chair or Deputy Chair and the response issued by the FOI unit at the first meeting following the recess period. Are members happy and content to delegate that authority to the Chair and Deputy Chair? Mm -hmm. Will not sell the family silverware or anything during the period. Um, then any other business I've been yes, informed sir. to, so Christopher was with me first uh, and your sister. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I I'm looking at the Assembly website and the section defining the powers of committees. So specifically, the Statutory Committee have the power to one, consider and advise on their department's budget and annual plans in the context of an overall budget, two, consider secondary legislation, take a committee stage of primary legislation, three, initiate inquiries and make reports, four, consider matters brought to their attention by ministers, five, initiate legislation, six, Call for persons and papers. If an individual who is summoned refuses to attend or refuses to produce the documents required by the committee, may be found guilty of an offence, fined or possibly imprisoned for up to three months. Uh, you will be aware, Mr Chairman, that in yesterday's plenary session of the Assembly, I, request, I made a request to you that this committee would consider initiating a committee-led inquiry into potential breaches of the COVID-19 regulations by government ministers. I would therefore like to propose that we seek advice in regard to the terms of reference for establishing such an inquiry and how that would sit within the functions of this committee that I have just outlined. Okay. Um, so, uh, Clerk. Sorry, Christopher, could you just repeat? The substance of yes, in, in, so in the I want uh, some advice in terms of where we sit within the system of government that we have. I would like some advice on the terms of reference for a potential inquiry for a, an inquiry into alleged breaches of the COVID nineteen regulations by government ministers. Okay, you've, I mean you've outlined what the remit of the committee is, mm -hmm. um, and the committee doesn't have a wider remit. To investigate whether breaches of regulations have occurred, that sits with the PSNI. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and I mean, there are media reports um, stating that the PSNI is a, is investigating, reporting that the PSNI is investigating. So I suppose there are two elements to this. One is whether such an inquiry would be within the remit of the committee. The other um, element to that is that <laughs> being careful not to create. Um, and the potential to prejudice the, the, the outcome of, absolutely. of investigations, whether it's the police or the assembly, commissioner for standards. That's absolutely, and that's why I'm suggesting that we initiate an inquiry, or we seek advice on terms of reference for an, a committee inquiry as to, uh, within the confines of how we operate within this storm and system, in the non-prejudicial way in terms of standards or police investigations. Okay. Um, so no, it's not. It's not required, but Trevor. But thank you. Um, okay. So, what we're saying, what maybe you're essentially <coughs> saying, Christopher, then is about seeking the advice as to whether or not the committee can, within its confines of the, can create the scrutiny under the issues that you've suggested. Um, how, how would that be sought? Would that be through legal we advice? Would you would be seeking legal advice, um, asking whether such an inquiry would be within the remit of this committee, and you would also be looking advice, in my view, um, 
just just to be clear, I just think it would be prudent to check whether we're not going to create the potential prejudice. That's fine. You know, for the outcome of any other. That's fine. Inquiry. I'm happy to. I'm happy to take your advice and take your steer on it. We are the scrutiny office. We are the scrutiny committee for the executive office, and I think there are issues that should be explored. But I'm happy to take your advice. Okay. So. Seeking that legal opinion, then, is the suggestion from, from Christopher. Are there any views one way or other? I, I, would, sure, I, I support Christopher's proposal. Okay. Pat? Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the, the purpose of this actually is. And, I mean, I suppose questions would need to be asked about whether a government minister can attend an event uh, as an individual or as a leader of a party or in a, in a completely different capacity. Uh, and, you know, the issue around uh, not just government ministers but MLAs and, you know, what is it we're talking about? Are we talking about the broad swathe of uh, large gatherings? Or the regulations may have been breached. Uh, are we talking about one specific event? Uh, and of course, the point you raised yourself, Marie. I mean, we don't want to be uh, trespassing on the SNI's ground uh, if they are responsible. I mean, if there has been a breach of the regulations, that's against the law. Uh, and. That's a job for the PSNI. It's, it's, not, it's not a job for a committee of the Assembly, I wouldn't think. Uh, I think that would be prejudicial to a police investigation. I can't see how a police investigation and a committee inquiry could run in parallel. Um, well, I think we're all very clear as experienced MLAs, we know that the role of this committee and other committees is, uh, is to scrutinise the role of, um, of the TEO committee or the TEO office. It's to scrutinise that office. It is certainly not within the remit of this committee to scrutinise the role of the vice president of Sinn Féin um, are Republicans, uh, for that matter, attending a friend's funeral. That is not within the remit of this committee. So I, I think that the committee should be very clear of what our remit is and the remits of other committees. So we are not a scrutiny body to scrutinise the role of the Vice President of Sinn Féin attending a funeral or for any other Republicans attending uh, a funeral of their friend <coughs> as Republicans, not as MLAs. That's not the scrutiny role of this committee. And I don't know uh, why this committee would even attempt to suggest that such, um, such, such an inquiry would take place by us. Okay, I, I mean, we can probably have a very long conversation about this. Um, there is essentially a request for the legal opinion, if there can be an investigation suggesting that it isn't the remit of the committee to do it, um, can I suggest that we seek the legal opinion and then we can have the conversation once we have the legal opinion as to whether or not uh, there is the grounds to do it and maybe if there's a disagreement on seeking the legal opinion, maybe we could draw that uh, conclusion quicker rather than discussing the merits of what the legal opinion would actually suggest. Would that be a way of helping to, to bring matters Closer, would that be? Can I suggest then, shall we seek the legal opinion? Would there be objections to that? Can I make a suggestion uh, that, that this issue has become quite toxic over the last uh, week or so? And I see no benefit to carrying on uh, trying to investigate, pursue, uh, getting the fog horns out, and so on. Uh, I see no advantage for us and here in the Assembly and in the Executive. I see no advantage for our constituents. Uh, and, I mean, how, how long do we keep this going for? 
people people have made their points. Uh, you know, they either agree or disagree with what has happened. Uh, and given all the shouting that there has been, uh, lots of other information has come out about other gatherings as well. So one person keeps digging and somebody keeps digging in another direction and so on. And where does it all end? Do we all end up right back at the precipice again with the institutions in, in danger of collapse? Because, I mean, I, I know there's no one here who wants the institutions to collapse. But if we keep prodding and prodding and prodding, these things tend to take on a momentum of their own. Uh, and, and we all lose control. And, and that's the difficulty in all of this. And I would ask, I would ask uh, Christopher, you know, to take some time out uh, and, and, and think about this again. Uh, and, and, and if he wants to come back with it and we go and seek legal opinion, fair enough. Uh, but, you know, I would respectfully ask him, in, in the interest of, of peace and harmony, uh, in, in, in the Assembly and in the Executive in general, that we try to put all of this behind us and, and move forward in a positive way. Here. Uh, Trevor, Emma, Doug. Um, I don't particularly object to asking for legal advice. It's always a sensible precaution if, if Christopher wants to insist on this. But I wonder if, if the legal advice came back saying, yes, it is perhaps within your remit to pursue this. Um, would we really want to do it? I, it to me, it, it marks of flogging a dead horse. Um, we're not satisfied with, with what what happened. We're not satisfied with yesterday's debate and the outcome. But I just wonder, and we, we actually do have a considerable work <coughs> as well. When will we get round to this? And the longer it takes, the longer we get away from the actual event that's caused this problem. The uh, less relevant, perhaps, it becomes, and also, where, where does the ministerial code come into this? Is there, is there, we not have a procedure of three standards that, uh, and a, a breach of the ministerial code on behalf of the two ministers involved can be investigated? No, we don't need to do. Chair, it's it's actually related to this, but then related to your own party leader and comments that he made. So last week we had a presentation um, from from the deputy and first minister. And Martina, in her contribution, had spoke about the process and about Bobby's funeral and the fact that Michelle attended her friend's funeral. And your party leader ref referred to her comments as sycophantic drivel. And I just, in terms of if we're talking about this committee's role, I just wonder if you would distance yourself as, as the chair of this committee from, from his comments and, and, and what he said in relation to, to his, his, his constituency colleague and, and Martina talking in, in grief about a very sensitive subject. I don't think it's a place for this committee to discuss MPs and their behaviour for there, so we'll leave it at that, Doug. Sure. Uh, I, I think we should ask for the advice, because that's what we're asking for, is the advice. So uh, I'm absolutely in support of, of, of Christopher. Um, we cannot turn a blind eye. We cannot say it's done and dusted. And for the harmony in this House that the people out there who are angry um, and sad over what happened, um, who are looking at us to say you made rules then you did not adhere to it. We cannot turn a blind eye to that, regardless of whether this is a difficult uh, tunnel that we're going down. And nobody wants to bring down these institutions. And you're right, absolutely right, Pat, we don't. Uh, and I'm sitting across here and we disagree, but we don't want to bring these down. But we cannot turn a blind eye to what happened, because there is a credibility issue here. There's a credibility with our executive office, and we're the scrutiny body with that. There's a credibility uh, with our executive because a minister broke these regulations, these guidances. There's credibility in this committee because some of the people in this committee broke the legislation and the guidance. So it needs to be more than that. So we're absolutely right to ask for the legal advice, as Christopher says, but I will go a little bit further. I think we need to write, because I think the executive office need to take the lead on this. They do need to wash their dirty linen out here, because they do need to give confidence to the people 
um, uh, of Northern Ireland that they will put this right. And I think we need to write to the Executive Office and ask them to set up an independent statutory inquiry into the events surrounding that funeral, um, including the actions of Belfast City Council, with clear recommendations at the end of it so that we could put this behind us and make sure that it never happens again and that the Ministers, the MLAs and the Deputy First Minister cannot, should not and neither should anybody be able to flout the rules that we make. That's what I think we need to do. Um, uh, and I think we need to agree that today, to write to them today, uh, and we can also get the legal advice that Christopher wants as well. But uh, just sorry, for but, yeah, I'm, I'm, again, I just want to be clear. I think one, that we can do two things here. We can spend the next hour, and we can spend the next hour rehearsing existing positions. And I could write probably the remarks for everybody that they're likely to say, but it's not going to achieve anything for us by the end of this meeting. That this. So I'm trying to see if I can keep us focused on just what it is that needs to be done. The suggestion was from Christopher about seeking the legal opinion as to whether we can have an investigation or not. And the suggestion from Pat was to just hold back for a couple of weeks and see if it can go behind us. As those two are likely to dovetail across each other, the seeking of the legal advice is likely to take a couple of weeks. I think maybe would it be a suggestion that those two things, that we seek the opinion if we can, and then the, that will take a couple of weeks, and when that legal opinion comes back, then at that stage we will be looking through maybe different glasses in terms of what has happened in the next two weeks. If we park that, and then the suggestion by Doug is, is somewhat different and additional, and I think that, that we need to give then the thought to that. So again, and then Chair, there, what the are we, one proposal of Chair, in terms of what are you seeking legal advice about? One event, an event, uh, events, plural, that have taken place across the North with members from those parties who are most focal in relation to this particular event as attended. Like, let's not have any of this committee accused of rank hypocrisy. So what are we asking the legal advice for? And I refer to a number of offence that, as my colleague said, if people were to dig in and just look around them and look around their own party and what had happened and re people's responses throughout this pandemic, all quite genuinely felt and done at that time, uh, and no one felt that they needed to be bought up or challenged because of where we were during the pandemic at the time of those events. So it's about trying to ascertain what are we asking legal advice about, that this committee has got the authority to carry out an inquiry into all of the MLAs across the different parties who may be accused of um, potentially breaching uh, regulations, um, or are we focusing on a single event? And I think that's where I need to understand exactly what the legal advice you're being uh, that's Chairman, being asked I think I've for. Made a proposal. Can you remind us just of that proposal in terms of in the context of what Martina has just said? Maybe just well, I, I thought I was clear enough. Obviously not. Well, obviously not. Obviously I thought not. it was very clear, actually, no, that it arose not. out of the discussion that was had in the Assembly yesterday. I made that clear. Okay, Clark, have, clear you, have you received that as...? Well, my interpretation of what's been said, it's um, seeking legal advice on whether we can investigate um, or carry out an inquiry um, to establish the scale of the breaches. Yeah, and also to ask, um, just to be clear, whether such an inquiry doesn't create the potential to prejudice the outcome of any other investigation. That's fine. Okay. Sorry, can I ask the scale of the breaches in relation to whom? The scale of the in breaches in relation to, to what? Minister. So the scale the of the breaches minister. in relation to the vice president of Sinn Féin attending a friend's funeral? Mr. That's Cameron. my understanding. You may 
would be referring to the Vice President of Sinn Féin. You're also referring to the Deputy First Minister, who has signed, we attended a who funeral has signed the ministerial pledge our friend. And, abide, and abides by the rules, well, abides by the rules that most members of this House have tried their very best to abide by. Okay, you're clear enough of what we're, okay. we're asking. I'm um, just clear that the committee is in agreement that we request well, I, Commission I, Legal Advice. I think we can go on the basis that there's a majority agreement to request okay. that information um, in that point. <clears throat> the second point... I'm, I'm, I'm not sure we can just leave it at that. Yeah, chair. I agree. I'm, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to go to a vote, but I think that would, uh, that would, it would clarify matters. But I, I don't think that persuasion from one side or other is going to change views, so that's why I'm taking the if, if, perspective if, that we're better to... If, if, if you're happy to note in the minutes uh, that myself and my two colleagues at least... Uh, in this committee, objected to this proposal. I'm happy. Fair enough. To go along with that. Fair enough. Yeah, okay. that's reasonable. Then we have the second suggestion from Doug about writing to the department to ask that they conduct a full independent investigation. I mean, I can start with views, but I mean, I can see a fundamental flaw that, you know, that, that any investigation is going to require the sign-off of both the First and Deputy First Minister, and I think that it will be a conversation that will flow fairly similar to here, but so I, I wonder about the... the, the you, 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 you could be right, you could be absolutely right, but what the point I'm making is, is, is this, uh, we are damaged, we are damaged in Assembly, we are damaged as an Executive, the Executive Office is damaged, um, what I'm saying is, Let's give them the opportunity to put confidence back into this again. Let them have the opportunity to do this. All I'm saying is write to them and ask them to try and put the confidence back in by having this independent inquiry. It's independent. When nobody can say that, nobody should be scared of an independent inquiry if they did nothing wrong. But it gives them the opportunity to do that. Now, if they choose not to do that, if people choose not to to have an independent inquiry about what happened uh, over this last 10 days, then, then you have to ask the question, why would they not want to have this? Because we can do it quickly, we can get the results quickly, we can move on quickly. Um, so what I'm offering is to give them the opportunity to take this forward. That's the point that I make. Statutory independent inquiry would, would provide results quickly. Well, <laughs> that would be a first. Have to say that. Well, well, I, I've got to say to the chair, um, Pat. When I, when I when I say quickly, I mean this is this is a, a relatively short period of time that we're talking about, uh, and it's a res relatively short set of circumstances that we're talking about. So I think they could do it quickly, and and I think that it would give confidence. And you know, if if nobody has anything to hide, then that independence really will help because we are all partisan in some way or another. I get that. Um, but that independence gives gives that independence. So that, that that's what I would suggest. I suggest, suggest. Sir, might I suggest? Sorry, go ahead. No, fair, fair enough, Doug. But I think the chair has outlined difficulties, and <coughs> you know you have one perception of what happened, and I have another. Uh, and to me, this appears to be developing into a witch hunt. You know, both some sort of independent uh, investigation into what happened. And I, I make the point again, and John O'Dowd you know, very eloquently last night, and he wasn't making judgments. Many of the people who signed that emotion last night have been engaged in large gatherings. Many of them. And you've probably seen some of the photos on, on social media, and I'm sure there's other evidence out there as well. You know, uh, you know somebody close to you dies, you're very close to the family, uh, you go to pay your respects to the front door and somebody grabs you and says come in, come in for a cup of tea and you know next thing you're in among 40 or 50 people. These things have happened with no intention in, 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 of, of any breaches of, of regulations or anything like that and sometimes some things are out of your control. You get a tap on the shoulder, you look around, next thing someone's taking a selfie with you, you know, so oh, 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 but I, I'm just outlining to you, you know, the broader picture and the chair has already outlined the difficulties. We're going to start writing to the first and deputy first minister to ask them to initiate 
a statutory public uh, inquiry, that's not going to happen. But I was about to say, could I suggest, as a means of drawing this to a conclusion, that we await, you can bring your proposal back at, at a future point, we await the legal advice and take it from there? Is that? Here, can I have Yes, go on ahead, George. George, go on ahead. Which I would like. Yes, I agree completely with as Bruce said. Thank you, you're agreeing with what Christopher has said. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Martina? Uh, Chair, I just think, you know, because this is um, over a week of daily comments uh, in relation to uh, the funeral of our, of our friend. Um, Bobby's story and the, the grief that his family has been feeling has been compounded every single day. So I think as, uh, as this committee is discussing this today, uh, it would be uh, appropriate to send out our deepest sympathy to, uh, to Bobby's partner, his family and, uh, and his sister and two brothers because um, as a family, they have been traumatised um, over the last week by what they have been subjected to as a family. And, um, and I just think it would be, it would be good to uh, send them out uh, the sympathy and thoughts of this committee. I certainly think everybody was quite clear in the debate yesterday that this, to try and as best they can to separate that out, that there is a family, that they are grieving, like all the families. I think from my research, there's five and a half thousand that have died during the whole process of coronavirus. And that, you know, we, we need to remember at all times that there are families that are, uh, that are left behind and that we offer our condolences to, to all of those. But we should restrict uh, our uh, discussions here to the behaviours that are being discussed. I think we have a way through, if I can bring us to a close in this, that we're going to seek the legal opinion. When the legal opinion comes back, we'll discuss the options at that stage. And then, Doug, you're going to hold off on your um, your um, suggestion or proposal this afternoon until uh, that stage and, and review it at that point. Chair, yeah. just, just one uh, question and point of clarity on, on Christopher's proposal. So the legal advice is just going to refer to his proposed investigation into one particular member's uh, alleged breach of regulations. It's not going to refer to then other potential breaches that could arise following yes. all the commentary that we have and the, the social media speculation I, I, and the photographs I, I, of yeah. people. I, I don't wish yeah. to speak yeah. to yeah. you. Uh, in a second, Trevor. I don't wish to speak for Christopher, but he can correct me if I'm wrong. I presume it's that if we're the Executive Office Committee that we are scrutinising the work of the First and Deputy First Minister and that therefore the, the, the discussion will be about the Deputy First Minister as opposed to the Vice Principal of a political party because as an Executive Office it's not our remit to discuss political parties or their leaders. Or Deputy Deputy but if they're in the role of First or Deputy First Minister as we're the Executive Office Committee, Christopher, that's correct. Yes, sir. Trevor? Well, I, I would thought that that should also make um, to it Conor Murphy, given he's a member of the executive as well. Yeah. Uh, that, that's an issue for the Finance Committee, I think, just on the back of the conversation that we've had, Trevor. And as I think we've reached the level of agreement that we're likely to, I'm going to bring the conversation to a close. Um, I mentioned earlier that we will um, look at the <laughs> Joint Committee uh, re results on the Wednesday, the 29th of July, and that we maybe will come back at that stage, if not, if there's a, a requisite under the legal opinion and it's a pressing issue or required, we can come back earlier, but maybe members, if we can leave it at that, and at this stage, aim to be back on Wednesday, the 29th of July. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.